so this is a topic that um, that we kind of skimmed over way back at the beginning of semester when we were covering chapter two. So in chapter two, we talked about vector algebra or more um, precisely, we introduced the vectors. Uh, this uh, might be uh, first uh, science math class where you've seen vectors. And even if it wasn't the first, really no other class emphasizes as much on vectors as uh, physics class does. So, uh, so at the beginning of the semester, we introduced the vectors as an arrow like a quantity that point that has a magnitude and direction. And um, we talked about vector sums and vector differences, or I guess that's one part of the vector algebra. So we talked about how if you have two vectors, you could add them, um, you could add them algebraically. You break them that down into components, add them component by component, and that gives you the some and we also talked a little bit about how you can add vectors uh, graphically the head to tail method uh, that gives you the the resultant vector um, without needing to refer to components and this uh, uh, geometric representation of the vector that is something that we really do focus on and it's important in um, understanding of physics, uh, conceptual under, understanding of physics as you go to higher levels. Uh, we talk about coordinate independent representation and whatnot. And <laughs> that kind of coordinate um, or the axis independent way of describing things, it really needs a mathematical object like a vector that in, exists independently of x and y axis that you might define. Now, chapter two actually covers more things about vectors that we kind of skipped on <laughs> back then. I don't think I gave you any uh, homework question or it didn't give you any homework question that directly referred to it. And uh, and all of that is in section 2.4, product of vectors. And today I want you to cover one half of what's in section 2.4, because in section 2.4, it covers two different types of products. And for today, uh, I want to spend some time talking about the dot product. So your textbook section actually does contain mostly everything. So <laughs> what I'll be lecturing on now will be more or less a duplicative of what's in the textbook. So if you already read it through the textbook, then great. Uh, what I say now in the next five to 10 minutes should be something that you already know, which is great. And um, this section also talks about a vector product, which we will uh, reserve for about three weeks. Um, we'll um, do the review of vector product or cross product uh, when we need them. Uh, we are going to need them as we talk about rigid body motion. So, uh, so with that, uh, I will just uh, do our coverage of uh, the dot product. So that product is a, it's a, it's a way to multiply two vectors. And um, I guess uh, um, the, in the simplest uh, description, you imagine there being two vectors, let's say vector A and B. And um, there might be some situation where you need to multiply these two vectors. Um, uh, one example would be when we talked about, say, when we talked about, wait, we did, haven't talked about kinetic energy. <laughs> I guess, okay, so we are now beginning to talk about that product because we are now coming to a place where we will need to start thinking about multiplying two vectors, okay. Um, so the context that you will see as we go through chapter seven this week is we are going to be defining work as a product of a force times a displacement. And the uh, thing is force and displacement, both are vectors. And vectors are more complex mathematical objects than simple numbers are. Numbers like uh, real numbers or even complex numbers, um, uh, you know, the scalars, uh, you know how to multiply them. That's kind of what you learn in algebra, um, what you learn in college algebra or pre-calculus or even before. 
Once you have uh, objects that are vectors, the fact that they have direction is an important thing and that um, that causes potential either ambiguity or uh, it, it's a it's something that you need to address and uh, uh, define the, the, define your operations precisely with respect to. So it'll turn out this uh, uh, kind of product defining work, it'll be defined through uh, that product. So since this is essentially a new algebra operation for us, I should just define it the way we define multiplication through you know multiplication table and and we define division and we define addition subtraction so we should define that product this is a new uh, binary operation uh, you know you, it takes two inputs vectors a and b and then it spits out an, an answer and with the dot product, the important thing about the answer that it spits out is that it's going to spit out a scalar answer. So sometimes we call this a scalar product, uh, which is super confusing because there's also multiplication by scalar coefficient, which is not the same thing as the product. But sometimes people do call it scalar product. You might also see the name inner product um, that has uh, some other reason for it i'm not sure uh, we will most of the time stick with the name that product and that refers to how we write this product usually we write it as vector dot center dot <laughs> with another vector and um this center dot is it has a different meaning from when you are just writing down i don't know x dot y and uh, when you do something like this usually dot is there to replacing a multiplication symbol and uh, sometimes you can even omit it it, it like no no that is a big deal the biggest thing about this dot in the dot product is that you should never omit it like if someone wrote something like a b this is an error in mathematical notation and when you say see a physicist to say something is an error in notation, you know it's serious because we are known for abusing notations. This is the kind of abuse that even we wouldn't do. So, so in a dot product, when you um, multiply these two things, you are going to get a number. Uh, you are going to get a scalar. You are going to get some um, much simpler mathematical quantity that uh, doesn't have a sense of direction. This will be scalar. And this is how the dot product is defined to give this a scalar number. Um, so because you are multiplying two quantities that have a sense of direction, so you need some way of characterizing those directions. And the way we define this, only the relative direction between the two vector matters. So there's an angle between the two vectors, call that theta. Then the product between these two is defined as uh, the magnitude of the two vectors, which are scalars, so we know how to multiply them already. So the uh, product of those magnitudes of two vectors. And then we multiply it by uh, cosine of theta. And uh, you might ask, why cosine? Why not sine? Why not tangent? And um, it, it's a definition I don't have to give a justification, except to, to um, bring this into alignment with maybe another definition that you might have seen. So, so this is what I like to call physics definition of that product. And if you have taken math classes where they do cover something like a dot product or maybe an inner product, you might have seen a different definition of dot product. So in I, I remember in my math classes, I've seen this. Uh, if you have uh, a vector dot product with the b, then the dot product was the product sum of the product of the component. <laughs> so you would take the uh, component ax, bx, uh, multiply them, add the, it with all the other uh, dimensions. You have typically x, y, z, three dimensions. And this would be presented as the definition of that product, unless that's what I remember in math class. And, um, this is the 
component definition of the product or I guess the math definition. And there's a reason I'm drawing uh, this distinction here. I I call this the physics definition, implying that we physicists prefer this over this other definition that some other people prefer. And the reason for it is um, it has to do with whether you have to define a coordinate axis. So when you look at this definition here, nothing here requires that you define a coordinate axis. If you have two arrows, you can measure the angle between them using whatever means you have, and then uh, proceed with this calculation without ever defining a coordinate axis like this is my x, this is my y. You don't ever have to do that to apply this definition. When you look at the component definition, well, the word component already implies that you have already found some axis or some basis that you are going to break down your vectors into. So even writing down of these components implies that you have defined an axis. Now, it might be that you could just choose any axis without loss of generality, as in having chosen this axis doesn't... Uh, actually affected that product. But this definition doesn't really make it clear that that is indeed the case. So, um, so in terms of how we define that product, we prefer to define it this way. Now, what I can do, and the reason for this lecture is, uh, let me give you the justification for using this as our definition of that, or rather, uh, let me show the equivalence between the physics definition of that product and the math definition of that product. And in fact, it's, uh, this is another reason I prefer, we prefer this instead of the other one. Um, um, proving this implication is actually a lot easier. It's uh, much easier to start from the physics definition and then uh, show that if this is true, then this is also true as well. Uh, going the other way, I'm not, I'm not sure if I can do that now. Uh, I'm sure there's a way, but uh, it's a lot harder, so <laughs> I'm not going to. So um, so let me sh uh, let me use this as a starting point and show that if you adopt this as your definition of that product, then in our three-dimensional Euclidean space, that implies this component by component version. So um, so the way to do it is to write these vectors uh, in their component form using unit vectors. So you might write A uh, in, the, um, in, in terms of the unit vector uh, decomposition of A. So if you imagine here, you know, there's, I have a X hat unit vector, Y hat unit vector, and um, you can describe A as um, scalar multiple of X hat, um, that's the X component plus some scalar multiple of Y hat, and those will be the components. So I can uh, write the vector A that way. So X component times the X hat for the X direction plus the Y component times the Y hat for the Y direction plus Z component times the Z hat. So this is the kind of um, writing that you can only do after you have defined your axis. And even though you don't see a G axis, you should assume that there's a G axis somewhere. And I can do the same thing with vector B. So BX, X hat plus BY, Y hat plus BZ, G hat. So those are our two vectors. And I guess uh, I should just do the product. This is the product I have. Let me just uh, multiply A and B. And um, I hope you will be a little bit, um, uh, I, I hope there is a little bit of confusion, like multiply, how do you multiply vectors? Because um, it's, uh, you know, that kind of wonderment is a sign of mathematical maturity, which is um, part of which ought to be taking care with any new mathematical operations that you see that you haven't seen before.
because um, you shouldn't <laughs> draw assumptions about what this dot means if you haven't seen it before. So let me just write it out first, and then I'll make a claim that um, I won't prove, but I can uh, honestly claim is true almost all the time. Um, so let me just write it out. I'm just replacing A with the expression for A I have here. So I have that, dot product with B. And the first question you should have is once you have this dot expression, like what do you do with this product? And um, and this is a bit of an assurance I can give. Um, there's a reason they call this a dot product, not dot summation or dot something else. Um, in the in algebra, the two basic operations are additions and multiplication. And when I say the word multiplication, it covers um, much bigger groups, <laughs> bigger things uh, that you will maybe see in abstract algebra or upper division level algebra classes. Um, one of the properties that um, that one this is one of the uh, care that mathematicians take when they uh, propose a new operation that they're going to call product or have some association with the sum. Uh, they make sure they obey certain properties. So you might have heard of things like associative property. I think associative property is something like if you have A plus B plus C, then you could do either A plus B, then C, or you could do A plus B plus C. And you might have heard things like uh, uh, a commutative property that's another one and there's um and here's the one biggest one that relate to things that we describe as addition with the things that we describe as a multiplication it's the distributive property it's uh, one of the few algebraic properties that you might have heard about that involves both addition and multiplication, like this associative property. It, I mean, addition has that property and multiplication has that property, but it's like de describing what the, that one operation does. But when you have a distributive property, that's a property that describes how multiplication interacts with, uh, with the summation. So, um, it's, uh, you know, something that you maybe haven't seen before. If you have A times B plus C, then it's equal to A times B plus A times C. That when you have a multiplication, you can distribute it into the things that are connected by summation that it's multiplying to. Like this kind of operation, you've done it many times with the mathematical objects that you are already familiar with. And, um, and what I'm telling you is that when mathematicians call something a product or multiplication of any kind, they should obey this distributive property. Uh, unless this particular operation had the property, they wouldn't call it a product, they wouldn't call it a multiplication because it would be super confusing. So with this new operation and this new issue object, we can rely on this distributive property to uh, simplify, to expand the things, expand it out and to uh, rewrite it in a way where we feel like we now can do something about um, <laughs> this product using the definition that we have. So, so let me distribute. Um, when I distribute, I'm going to have nine terms. Uh, I guess let me write it all out. <laughs> so I'll just be writing silently those nine terms that uh, goes from uh, multiplying ax with the bx. So I have ax x hat times bx x hat plus ax times by. So that's the pattern. Uh, now I have ax x hat multiplied with a b, z, z hat. Okay, let's keep going. So that's the three of the nine. <laughs> the other three will come from a, y, and then the remaining three will come from a, z. So I just have to write this out. a, y, y hat. Many of them will go to zero, but I think it's uh, instructive to see all the terms, even the ones that will go to zero. Um, 
because I think uh, if you have never seen the terms that vanish, then um, you haven't had a chance to learn why they vanish. Okay, plus a y y hat times b t t hat. Okay, one more, <laughs> and we'll be done. Uh, so this is gonna involve the g component of uh, a, and then all three components of x. I mean b. And note how I'm always putting that dot because um, that, with the dot product, it's not an implied multiplication. You have to explicitly write the dot, otherwise you've missed something important. All right, so, so that's the expression with the nine terms that we are evaluating. Now, I'm going to just say and appeal to some properties that I think we all agree that they have. One is the, the, um, um, the commutative property, meaning if I swap this order of uh, these two things, then it doesn't change anything. Like if I swap, uh, if I wrote somehow x hat ax, like that, it's a still scalar, it's a scalar multiplication or it's a multi multiplication by scalar. So where you put the scalar doesn't matter. Um, that's one. And, and so in fact, so as an example, like here, I could rewrite this as ax bx times x hat dot with x hat. Uh, this would be an allowed operation because of commutative property of the scalar with the vector and in multiplication. And when you look at this uh, um, definition of the dot product carefully, although you know, I don't need that property, so let me not invoke it. Uh, with the dot product, the dot product also commutes. If I have x dot x hat, x hat dot x, or uh, a dot b is equal to b dot a. It's a true property, but I don't think I need it, so let me not, um, let me not invoke it. Okay, so, so using that commutative property, I can, I can simplify all of these terms in terms of what happens with the dot product of the two unit vectors. So if you have x hat dot product with x hat, there is something I can simplify based on the physics definition of dot product. Product of magnitudes, one times cosine of the angle between them. If it's the vector with itself, angle between them is zero. The cosine of zero is one. So this dot product is one. And you have x hat dot product with y hat. And when you do x hat dot product with y hat, you see, okay, the product to the magnitudes is one. And cosine of angle between x hat and y hat is 90 degrees. They are perpendicular to each other. So cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So this dot product is zero. And you will see the same thing with the x hat dot product with the g hat. This is the same thing for x hat dot product with the g hat. And for the remainder here, essentially what you will see is that when you have the dot product of unit vectors, uh, if it's the one and the same, then it's gonna be one. That will be true for y hat, dotted to y hat or g hat dotted to g hat. And for any other combination that mixes x with y, y with g, uh, you are going to get zero. So for any other combination, you will get zero. And that gives us our vanishing terms. Uh, this product is going to go to zero because the dot product goes to zero. This is gonna go to zero. And this is gonna go to zero, y hat dot to x hat. Okay, this one will survive. This will go to zero, this will go to zero, this will go to zero, and this will survive. So out of the nine terms, you only have three remaining terms. And those three remaining terms are ax times bx plus um, ay times by plus ag times bg.
And this is the component by component description of that product. And, um, and, and this might have been given to you as the definition of that product, which is fine. These two definitions are equivalent to each other. So you can start from one end and get to the other end, vice versa. Uh, but I find this direction to be a lot easier. And uh, one last note, um, you're going to see this more, well, um, this is something that's more useful in more abstract math classes, but I think it's worth pointing out. Uh, this uh, um, placement of uh, cosine theta, it becomes a very useful way to define angle, particularly in situations where it's hard to imagine the angle in a physical space. So, you know, in two dimensions, you can see the angle. It's not a big deal. Like, so this is not something that's a super useful or appears to be useful. But, and, but this is something that's useful when you are starting to deal with a three-dimensional space. Because sometimes when you see the angle, when it's rotated in some way, then it becomes harder to like take a projection and whatnot. Um, and it's something that becomes essential as you deal with uh, higher dimensional vector spaces in upper division math. So, um, so you have this uh, equality, that this uh, numerical value for that product should be equal to this numerical value for that product. The magnitudes of the vectors times cosine of theta. And using this equality, you can do an interesting, interesting thing. You can solve for cosine theta. And when you solve for cosine theta, this is what you get. Cosine theta is equal to uh, sum of i going from 1 to 3 <laughs> ai. Bi, that's the dot product component of the description of that product, the left hand side, divided by the product of the magnitudes, A times B. And so this, in some sense, it gives you a way to define angle theta, particularly in context where um, it's not immediately clear how to represent the angle. So in, in the context where we are introducing this dot product, two-dimensional kinema, two-dimensional vectors. It, this is, seems kind of silly. You can just measure the angle. But this idea of, uh, this uh, idea of quote-unquote angle is uh, something that becomes more useful in, uh, more, um, in, in more abstract linear algebra context. So, so you'll probably see that in the future. I just want you to highlight. Um, I think there was one homework set in week one where the, yeah, I remember doing this in virtual class session. There was a one thing that was asking about um, angle between two vectors in three-dimensional space, and uh, this was the way to quickly do it because once they've given you the components, that product is super easy to compute, and you can compute the magnitudes and from that get the angle. And it's one of those things where if you're trying to visualize it, then it's hard <laughs> when you do algebra. Algebra is a lot easier. so. So yeah, I think that's the comprehensive coverage of that product. And again, uh, we held off on this until now because now is the time when we need it to describe, um, describe work. Uh, we define work done as a dot product between the force. So this is the work being done by this particular force. That's a force dot product to displacement. Both are vectors, and the way we define that product, it'll give us a scalar. So work is a scalar quantity, and um, and this is the first time when we really need uh, really need that product to uh, describe some physical quantity that we are interested in. So here we are. So, and yeah, and, and uh, there are <laughs> other ways to describe that product. Sometimes uh, this can be described in terms of um, a um, projection. So you can imagine taking projection of f along the delta x as described by f parallel to delta x times the delta x, or the other way around, f times um, the component of delta x that's uh, parallel to force. That's so both of these descriptions come down to matter of 
which of these two magnitudes are you associating this cosine theta with? Because uh, you could describe this as the projection of B onto the um, direction along A. Or if you had A times cosine theta, you could describe it as projection of A along the direction of B. So, okay, I think that's the last thing I need to say about that product.